This is Hunter Muse. And this is Chris Snipes. And you are listening to The Melt. Uh, why don't we why don't we kick it off and I'll just start with you, Josh, since you are the editor of the book. What was the impetus that uh, caused you to want to herd all the cats that it took uh, to get all of this into some sort of cohesive form? It's a good question. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I've, I've constantly been trying to experience new modalities of writing, if that makes any sense. So after having done the solo thing several times in a row, um, I was looking to see what it's like from the side of a contributor slash editor on a project of, of multiple essays. Um, and now, now that I'm on the other side, I'm not sure I'd ever do it again. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, um, and not anyone else's fault. It was just, uh, logistically it becomes a bit to handle. And, um, I, it's, it's also a commentary on myself. I'm not great at, staying out of other people's writing um so i I sort of wanted to see how i would handle that and i think Mm -hmm. i maybe um here and there exerted my own influences a little bit too strongly but um all that being said uh i kind of wanted to do something that was a little bit more casual um i've always been a fan of anthologies and compilations and things like that I, i used to you know in high school i used to read science fiction short story compilations all the time because the great thing about those is that if you come across something you don't like you can either power through it or you know uh skip it you know (laughs) and go on to the next thing so Mm -hmm. i've always been drawn to that sort of um short form aspect as a you know consumer of the sort of thing and a while back i had an idea that i still might do at some point in the future but just a sort of book that um illustrates how firmly these motifs that are specific to fairy folklore, not just that of Western Europe, but worldwide, Mm -hmm. how firmly they still remain in our language, in our culture, in our society. I don't think anybody really apprehends (laughs) um, the the depths to which we're still influenced by these older ways of thinking. you know, the example that I provide in the, the forward to fairy films is, you know, terms like, uh, the, you know, stroke, the medical term stroke is a direct mm-hmm. allusion to the fairy stroke and the, the color cobalt is a direct allusion to the kobolds, you know, that used to be in the, uh, mines of, of some parts of Germany. So, um, the, you know, once you start looking for those things, you end up seeing them everywhere, you know, uh, in advertising, of course, but also in our own language and in sort of the way that we present these things. So that sort of was the idea um, that turned into fairy films. And um, and it was sort of a way to look at how the, the original mandate of the project um, was to take a look at films that don't mention fairies or elves or goblins or anything like that and show how those motifs cropped up, even in the absence of, you know, explicit fairy stuff. It sort of morphed into a 50-50 uh version where half the essays were about you know non-fairy films and half the essays were about films that explicitly mention fairies Mm -hmm. but you know once you're getting handed stuff that is as um compelling as you know dr jack hunter's essay talking about labyrinth and dark crystal i mean i i kind of am sitting there and i'm like well i love labyrinth i can't just you know take out labyrinth um from from a book on fairy films so it kind of became a half and half and what was really interesting about that was 
that not only do these motifs appear in the absence of fairy folklore, they even endure in the face of fairy folklore that that gets it wrong, so to speak. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's an essay at the end um, by Dr. Simon Young um, that discusses Walt Disney's treatment of uh, fairy folklore. And, like, Disney is sort of the go-to offender when you're talking about the the mishandling of fairy folklore, you know, like, well, it's not like Tinkerbell, but, um, you know, I think Simon did a great job in his essay of sort of situating it within a different context and a different lens that sort of allows you to appreciate the things that are correct in that and really sort of situating the, um, the corpus of Disney animated films and Disney projects through this sort of tension between folkloric fairies and theosophic fairies mm-hmm. um, from theosophy. And I just thought it was an interesting angle. So, it, so that's, if, if I had just sort of kept it exclusive to, you know, there can't be any mention of fairies in the films, then I would have sort of denied myself uh, getting access to essays like that. And then you had people coming out of the, out of left field with these, uh, crazy ideas like uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show and mm-hmm. Twin Peaks as Mark put together. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, I, I never, I always realized that these, these motifs were widespread, but like after you, I think after you read fairy films, you're going to see them in a lot of media that you consume. Just, mm-hmm. they're just everywhere. You know? For sure. So Mark, did you write your, your Twin Peaks essay in response to this book when, when Josh was putting it together? Or did you already have it written by that point? No, it was definitely in response. Um, I was just looking around for something that would interest me. And I had been considering rewatching the series at the time. Can, uh, are you hearing me properly? Because I've got mm-hmm. a lag behind here, as mm-hmm. you mentioned earlier. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, it was it was in response, but I had sort of got Twin Peaks on my mind because I'd been considering rewatching it, which I then did. Um, I could, it was, uh, I think it was March 2020, I think it was, or around that time. Um, Yeah, it was just, it was something I was looking at again with a sort of fresh perspective because when I watched it back in, was it end of 89, beginning of 90, something like that, I was just a young man then, you know, and uh, I I enjoyed it for different reasons. I didn't see all the folklore in it. I mean, I I wasn't really interested in the folklore in it, really. Um, I saw it from a, I loved the zany humor. Mm. I... I enjoyed the, you know, the cast of lovely ladies and, uh, you know, I was just, and it was just fun. It was like um, quirky, I suppose. Quirky is the word that sort of summed it up when I was, you know, when I watched it first time. Um, But with, with Josh's, you know, getting us to look at all these things with with sort of fresh eyes, as he just said, it's like, there's so many films now I watch and I see this stuff. I never saw it before. And it's just, it, it was an exercise in keeping me, um, you know, exercising my brain to actually think more deeply about what I'm watching instead of just mm-hmm. sort of like going over my head, you know, just studying, sitting and studying something. I literally watched every episode and made notes and went back over things if I didn't quite get them and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, uh, I'm probably a bit too methodical. When I look at the essay now, I. There's a whole section I wouldn't have even put in there because I felt that, in retrospect, I put some of that in because I didn't want people to think I hadn't seen those things. But I had seen uh-huh. them, but they weren't the focus of my... But I, 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 it's a sort of um, trying a people-pleasing thing. I think, well, I was just trying to put that stuff in because I didn't want people to go, oh, he didn't spot this and he didn't spot that. So I sort of ended up with almost, there was a middle section, which I wasn't happy with personally afterwards, where I just put lots of, like, almost like a list. Uh-huh. Um, but, you know, I'm sort of reasonably happy with it. But but I was particularly interested in the, in the whole forestry as, aspect of it, you know, how that ties yeah. into folklore that I'd been reading from uh, people mm-hmm. like Macken and Blackwood. I mean, I love all that stuff. So anyway, I'm going on. So <laughs> over to you. No, we're, you guys should go on. That's what we're Sorry. what we're here for. I like the aspect of the, what takes well. place in the forest too. Twin Peaks is that's where the Dark Lodge is. That's where the mm. portal is, sort of into the netherworld, yeah. where 
Yeah, where the dream space yeah. and and lots of other things occur, and the doppelgangers reside. Yes, yeah, yeah. And jo Josh, I mean, you said the whole not... the whole woods aspect is sorry. No, no, go ahead. It's the lag. No, it's okay. I was just going to say that I sort of tied it into my own sort of young years because you know, I loved to spend time in the woods when I was younger and I used to, I, I had, you know, I did experience a few strange things in the woods, you know, so um, I was able to bring all that into it. So, okay. Uh, I'll stop. That's what I was going to so get back in. That was actually <laughs> what I was going to ask you, Mark. Um, you are from Cornwall in England, correct? Well, yes. Yeah. Well, sort of. I've, I've, I've spent many years in Cornwall, um, mm -hmm. probably cool. 20 plus but i've also i've also lived in the southeast and the northeast i've, I've traveled a little bit um but yeah sorry go on the reason i was asking is that i have recently uh gathered a collection of books about the history of cornwall and kind of the lore the ghost right. history yeah. of cornwall and it seems yes. to be a very paranormal right. part of the world uh, and I, what I was going to ask you is, do you think that is, that, yeah. Yeah. that that experience somehow informed maybe your relationship with the fairy lore? Because that is such a a fairy lore centric part of the world. Yeah. yeah. Well, definitely. I mean, the the whole I so I I wasn't actually raised in Cornwall, but I went there later in life. But I was constantly going there on vacation. You know. And my, my father has Cornish, very close Cornish, Cornish, or did have very close Cornish connections. So I was always down there. And I used to hear these stories about the knockers, or as in America they're called Tommy knockers. Um, yes. And, and I've, I'm just fascinated by that side of it, you know, and the Spridgens um, and the Piskies, of course. So you've got all that going on, and you've got all the ancient monuments and all the rest of it. And you've got all these stories. Now, for the particular piece of Cornwall, which I'm particularly interested in, is the very, very far west, and it's very small area. And these creatures are just like, they're sort of, if if you think of Cornwall as a whole, they're not really common to the whole of Cornwall. It's mostly that very end piece near Land's End. Um, so I sort of grew up on all these stories, and I read all these. And also the mermaids, of course. The mermaids are a huge thing down there. Mm. Um so yeah, that's that was a huge part of it for me. But we also had a bit of that in not the same stuff, but we also had. I was raised in Surrey, which is south of London, sort of halfway between London and the south coast, and it's a very mm. very heavily wooded area, a very hilly, very wooded. And well, you know, I was actually raised on the site of gunpowder works, um, which was haunted, very haunted. My my father had an experience there. Um, he he would never talk about it because it was it really creeped him out um, mm -hmm. very very rarely. Um, so I sort of grew up with that in my mind, and then we moved from that site when I was only about two, I think. Um, but we moved further along this particular the same river, very small river. They call them Bournes, B O U R N E, and it was pretty much the same, you know, just like these little copses, woods, and um, I sort of spent a lot of time in the woods you know so that all tied into it as well yeah sometimes i wonder you know looking at a place like the uk with such a drastically reduced woodland compared to how it began if um these forces didn't become more concentrated <laughs> compared to the to the united states where we still have yeah. so much you know yeah. forestry um I, I sometimes wonder that mm -hmm. yeah well they yeah, had to go somewhere nice. Maybe right in yeah. cellars <laughs> yeah they, they, they had to go somewhere and they can they can be anywhere but i think they prefer places that are wilded mm -hmm. um, yeah and there's also the subterranean mm -hmm. aspect of it too. They can always escape the surface and all the tumult going on in the surface underneath. But I don't. I never got the impression that that's where they strictly dwell. That maybe that's sort of their home base, but they come out and play on the surface. 
Yeah, you know, but they also move in. You know, I, I think this this idea of of fairies moving into artificial man made uh, features is kind of an important one because you've got you know all these fairy forts and ring forts throughout uh, Europe. You know, especially you know com- what comes to mind is Ireland and the British Isles and whatnot. The, the, the rounds that you have in yeah. Cornwall are they called rounds, Mark? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, well, we got we got sort of ancient um, hill forts and things, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, but you know, with the in in Cornwall, you know, you've, you've got the uh, the the knockers, the Tommy knockers, and the mines, and that's you know, a lot of these were excavated by yeah. humans, but somehow, yeah. that's so, so there's some there's some sort of interplay yeah. between us abandoning things and it's sort of being right. taken over by by these other spirits and genus loci. And the question is, were, yes. you know, were they there to begin with, or are yeah. we, you know, sort of bringing them in, or or what, you know? I don't yeah. Know. Well, I, the the whole knocker thing. I mean, you can. I've I sort of discussed this in one of one of my books. I think. Um, I've sort of traced back the history of them, and just just through reading all the old folklore and stuff. Plus, I've been thinking about the origins of you know where we where we came, where the British, where the Cornish came from in particular. And there's this very strong link with what we call, in, I'm not sure what you call it, but we call it the Middle East. So, you know, Israel, um, Syria, all these sort of places. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a very, very strong link between those two areas. And a lot of the um, ideas, the old religions and stuff, they came up through the Med, around, around and up through France and into Britain. Now, getting back to the knockers, because I'm getting distracted, distracted myself. The, the knockers were allegedly were Jewish. So you, you had this idea that they were Jewish miners. They were like little miners um, mm. who had been working because the, the tin mines go back like three, four, four thousand years, supposedly. So you had people, they had this very strong link between the Middle East and Britain. And a lot of these people would come into Cornwall, and I've, I've looked into this a lot. Uh, there's a lot of place names in Cornwall which are sort of linked to the Middle East. Um, and there's there's all sorts of, I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head. But there's there's so many of them. And I've, I've just recently considered another one which may may or may not be. And it just suddenly struck me when I was listening to some other guys talking about this. Um, certain, okay, so when, 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 when I've moved from uh, England to America, for example, I see English place names all over the place, plus mm-hmm. German yeah. and you mm-hmm. know Swedish mm-hmm. and so on. So the idea is that when people move, they take their place names with them because they're familiar and they put those, they rename their villages, towns, whatever. And mm-hmm. that I think that was happening in Cornwall going back thousands of years. So there's a place called on the coast called well, it's spelt Mouse Hole, but you don't mm-hmm. say Mouse Hole, you say or the locals say Mausel. Mm-hmm. And then I was listening to somebody say, and I thought, well, Mosul, maybe Mosul in, um, is it Syria or somewhere around there? And, and mm-hmm. that's another example. And maybe, just maybe, maybe there's a link there as well, you know, it's a bit, uh, <laughs> a bit extreme maybe, but, um, but yeah, sorry, I'm, go- I'm going off the subject again. But there's a definite link between these old miners and maybe they were just ghosts of miners. Um, so it's sort of you've got this ghostly aspect, but you've also got this sort of folklore thing, and it's all tied in together. So they were supposedly helpful sometimes, and not so helpful other times. So they would warn these tin miners that there might be a, a a rockfall coming or something, you know. And even when the mines were closing down, sort of, I think about first, I think the last one was about twenty years ago or something. These these miners still believed in all these old customs. There were still things, that, and it's the same with the fishermen in Cornwall. They they still, you know, they're on their way to their boat to go out to sea to go fishing, and they see a black cat, or they hear somebody whistling. They basically will take the day off, you know. So <laughs> it, it it it's it's still with us. It's still with us now, really. So. Yeah, that's that's interesting, and it it really does sort of reinforce how complex all this 
folklore surrounding fairies is it's it's i don't know if it's the least cut and dry of all sort of spirit folklore that there is i'm sure that there are other examples you could point to that are equally um mixed up <laughs> but it really is a mosaic of so many different beliefs and and the thing that i always you know try to stress is that you know we, while we're most familiar with the fairy folklore of europe like it it is an international thing um you know uh from the you know north american traditions where i think some, some something like 70 or 80 percent of of indigenous tribes here had some sort of little people belief mm -hmm. to you know the middle east which is why i always find it really funny when um people in the disclosure movement are talking about like you know well i think it's gin and i'm like well what about fairies and they're like no a gin and i'm like well we're kind of talking about the same thing because <laughs> you can and it's probably yeah. part of the reason that you know i think fairy folklore <laughs> uh yeah. travels really well um mm -hmm. you know it it's at one point there was this belief that um that fairy folklore in america only really took root in the northeast um but the more i've looked at it the more it just seems to really have spread i mean you have tommy knocker legends uh that have made their way as far inland as montana mm -hmm. um you know and uh i think uh morgan daimler is going to be releasing a book right. on uh on North American um, folklore surrounding fairies uh, coming up soon. It sort of looks at sort of the, the way these imports came in and were sort of syncretized with with these other beliefs. So that totally makes sense. And I kind of wonder, you know, I think that the flexibility of fairy folklore is what has allowed it to endure into other media because it does have this sort of mm -hmm. melting pot quality um, that I don't think you necessarily get in stuff that is as rooted to belief systems like you know demons or uh you know i'm trying to think of something else but like you know if people want to say that mothman was the garuda bird or you know just things that things that are really tied to a to an to a, a religious structure i think are a little bit more brittle than something that falls under this umbrella of, of fairy folklore and that's part of the reason that it continues to endure and it doesn't doesn't go away it just changes as evidenced by the you know the ufo contact experience mm -hmm. So are there only yeah. uh, one size, is there kind of like a one size fits all version of the fairy that could be a through line for all cultures, meaning are they all small in every culture or are some of them giants, but still considered fairies? Well, the size is one of those things that is a bit of a wouldn't even say it's a misnomer because it is something that that sort of shows up as as a as a bit of connective tissue but um it's something that i think has become overemphasized you know mm -hmm. as pop culture has continued um diane perkis who has written quite a number of really great excellent books on fairies um broke it down into i believe eight fairy characteristics um which was that fairies tend to exist outside human communities they um abduct the vulnerable they capture others and hold them in a place of eternal storyless youth. They possess anomalous bodies, not spirit and not material, but somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. um, maintain close ties to specific locations and formations in the landscape. They tend to feature in cultures among the laity as opposed to the upper echelons of society. Peasant cultures is what Perk has called it. Mm -hmm. And also um, she believed that they were, they had this quality in a lot of these different do these different regions that they were either people or they were like people who were trapped, you know, somewhere in their lives, often, you know, the dead, but you could even add to Diane Perkis's list and say that you'll find time and again, associations with wind and levitation and strange lights, the underground element, supernatural time lapses, offerings being given um, and changelings, of course, you know, which, so, so I think once you get all those things together, if it, if it meets, you know, a majority of those criteria it's probably some variation on the the same fairy motif and again you know i'm, I'm sure that y'all know this but my stance has always been with a lot of the stuff that these are just labels you know they're just right they're ways that we you know they're, they're ways that we have that we've developed to make sense of of what these things are and it's not really an ontological uh objective read on what those these things are necessarily and is there an association with animals yeah 
I mean, I think you'll find that. It, well, it, it sort of ties into another frequently mentioned aspect, which is the sort of shape-shifting aspect. And one of the favorite things to shape-shift in was um, animals, a strong association with birds. Um, but also, you know, in, in parts of the world like, uh, like Mark grew up, um, you know, large black dogs, um, things of that variety. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it seems like I remember reading many years ago when I read uh, Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, a um, fantastic book that I want to get back to. But some fairies in particular reason, regions were attributed to maybe great wars that had happened there. And these were the, the, the spirits of the dead. Does that ring any bells? Well, the dead generally, the great war aspect, I'm not sure. I mean... There's been a lot of back and forth over the years about whether or not you can sort of map the different alleged proposed suggested fairy kingdoms over the sort of changing um, tribal land claims in Ireland. And and there is something Mm -hmm. to that. But yeah, I mean, there's always been a a close association with the dead and this idea that um, a lot of, again, it's so mixed up and contradictory like sometimes yeah. the fairies are the dead and sometimes they just appear with the dead and sometimes they have nothing to do with the dead at all um but yeah th- there there's there is something to that i mean that that book fairy faith in the celtic countries is something that i just keep returning to time and time again because depending on where i am in my studies it always gives me something different to think about you know yeah yeah, yeah. For sure it's so thick there's so much going yeah. on and i like it because it's like uh it's like somebody going out in the field and talking to the people in these villages about what they know about um, these fairy stories and where they heard about them and do they still exist in their region? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 kind of <laughs> it's better field work than most ufologists do, right? <laughs> I mean, it really is. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, it's interesting. One one of the things I find most interesting about that book is how. I mean, you know, Evans Wentz had some ties to theosophy, but it, so I don't know if this is a sort of a select a selection bias that's present in the book, or if, or if this other scenario, which is the scenario that I find really fascinating, which is how quickly a lot of those theosophic ideas took root in a place like Ireland that up mm-hmm. until then really didn't have that sort of context for viewing the fairies. But you do find people alluding to things like, you know, elementals, mm-hmm. these sort of really Paracelsian terms that you wouldn't have seen if yeah. fairy faith in the Celtic yeah. countries had been collected, yeah. you know, 60 years earlier than, than it was, because it was 1911. So that's yeah. super early to see that sort of diffuse like that. Mm-hmm. Were you going to say something? There's, um, if you think about, yeah, I was going to say, if you look up, um, I don't know, Hunter, whether you've looked into a, a guy called uh, the Reverend uh, Robert Stephen Hawker, because you should really look into him. He's fascinating, because Josh just jogged my memory there, because there's a very close link between like the clergy in Cornwall and all this, mm. you know, uh, anomalous activity of all these beings. Um now, he, he fully believed in angels and mermaids and all the rest of it. And he, he was a fascinating character. And he, he wasn't the only one. A lot of these um, old sort of Church of England vicars and, and, you know, going back before then, probably, there's a very strong tie-in between, you, you know, the church and, as I say, mermaids and f- folklore generally, you know. And they, they I suppose they're one and the same in a way. But they just love this stuff, you know. As I say, Robert Stephen Hawker is well worth looking into. I actually, um, he he built a, he, he was a fantastic character. He lived very near the edge of this really extreme high cliff. And he used to rescue shipwreck sailors and so on. And he wrote poetry and he he, he actually, I'm trying to think, he, he wrote a famous hymn, I'm trying to think what it is. Oh, um no, he's gone. He's gone. I'm, thinking, I'm confusing him with someone else. It's Baring Gould is another one. Look into Baring Gould. And he was again, a, a Reverend Sabine Baring Gould. A lot of these clergy people wrote extensively on folklore and they lived it. They lived it too. So, um, yeah, there are a couple of names you should definitely check out Hawker, Robert Stephen, and uh, Sabine. Yeah, the Reverend Sabine Baring Gould. So I wonder so, um, if they called yeah. them, them angels because that was more acceptable from a a 
clerical uh, perspective than to call it a fairy. So if you were in a church service and you said, I saw a fairy on my way. (laughs) Yeah, there doesn't seem to be a hard and fast rule to to the application of those principles because you do find clergy who sort of acknowledge the existence of fairies. But what they would tend to do is they tend to fold it into this sort of war in heaven uh, mm. narrative where, you know, oh, the fairies were the ones who, depending on whom you ask, were too good for hell and too bad for heaven, or they're the ones who were caught yeah. outside the gates of either when the battle was over and they fell to earth, and wherever they fell to earth is where they landed. But I think there's an, <clears throat> there's an if not a book, yeah. an essay to be written on the treatment, the difference of treatment of these topics um, in the United States versus the UK, because if you look at... um you know, whenever I embark on a project, I tend to look at the back issues of the MUFON Journal here in the U.S. and the back mm-hmm. issues of Flying Saucer Review, that excellent publication that was out of the out of the U.K. Uh, going around the same time period. You know, especially having the heyday in the '60s and '70s and '80s, and um, the the treatment of these subjects, even in that the UFO subject, um, is so different. And you have people in you know across the pond talking about things um that we're just now talking about in uh in the u.s or just have in the last you know 20 years or so um just really odd esoteric ideas um you know one of the first people to sort of bring up the connection between ufos and gin was gordon Crichton, who was the editor of flying saucer review and i think that sort of speaks to the nuance with which um you know, British and perhaps even Irish and Scottish clergy uh, were able to handle something like the, the, the fairy faith and to be like, Mm -hmm. okay, well, you know, here's, here's our faith, but we also accept that the the world is a lot more complicated (laughs) than our faith demands. Whereas in America, you get this sort of, um, you know, this fundamentalist strain, which I think even, you know, even if nobody writing for MUFON journal was a, a, an attending church member, even if that Mm -hmm. was the case, which is not, but even if that was the case, that there's sort of a, an American outlook in that is culture. tied to that. Yeah, yeah it, it sort of excludes a lot of these stranger possibilities, and they have to be people from another planet as opposed mm. to these other sort of older, stranger yeah. things. Yeah. Yes. And are they always mm. b- benevolent, or do they have malevolent oh, no. intentions and energies? No. Yeah, p- p- yeah, yeah. I mean, p- p- part of the reason that... um. Part of the reason that I, when I wrote Ecology of Souls, I, I chose that sort of language from Terence McKenna was because it speaks to the broad uh, spectrum of alliances and dispositions and things that you run into in the other world. And sort of, mm-hmm. you know, if you think about an ecology, like, you know, you have animals that are more aggressive um, than others, both on a species level and on, a, on an individual level. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the way that I tend to think about a lot of um i mean there were some positively aligned fairies that were very hard to offend and some very negatively dispositioned fairies that were would be quick to to you know get upset with you but the way i tend to think about most of it is like you know a shark like a shark isn't evil and it isn't good but it's it's interests don't always align with yours exactly. um it just, but, you it know, just is yeah yeah yeah, I mean, it's in uh, in a lot of their you know sort of attitudes could shift on a dime for something that was really silly. I mean, it was um, in some brownie traditions uh, from Scotland, like you, the brownie would do a lot of household maintenance and would help you out in the household and would help your you know your yeah. beer ferment and stuff like that. But you shouldn't thank it <laughs> because once you thanked it and acknowledged it. There was some sort of implication of a of a servant master relationship that the brownie would sort of take offense at. So. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it's kind of, it kind of reminds me of whenever I would bring a a girlfriend home to visit my mother. Like there were a lot of unwritten rules (laughs) that you you shouldn't violate. And if you did, even if you didn't know it was a, even if you didn't know you weren't supposed to, then it was a big deal. Yeah. Interesting. (laughs) Well, Mark, what about you? You said that you, 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 the, one of the things that you wrote about in your Twin Peaks essay was the woods, the reoccurring motif of the of the forest uh and you said that you had some experiences mm-hmm. in cornwall when you were young in the forest w- w- you mind going into those a little bit no that no that was in um my experience in the forest was in surrey in the south of England. Oh, okay gotcha. um, which was and it you know and it was something that could <laughs> how to explain it um 
I used to sort of regularly just wonder. It was we called them copses in the southeast of England, um, where I was actually raised, and they're just small woods. They're very small woods, and I used to just often just wander in there. Have have I lost you? No, no, we're here. We're here. Have I lost you? Oh right, right, okay. No, no, right, okay. Yeah, I um, I used to just wander in there sometimes and just sort of just listen, just listen to what was going on in the woods around me, you know, and just sort of a bit of peace and quiet and think about things. And there was one occasion I was in there where everything just went really, really deadly quiet, and all the all the noise of the you know just the the general, um, you know, the life squirrels and you know the little scurrying mice or whatever it was everything just went super quiet and i i know i was talking to a, an old chap who's sadly now in, in america when i came here and i was telling him about that experience and he was raised in the appalachians and you know they, they literally had to go and shoot animals to live you know they had that was it they lived off the land sure. more or less yeah, yeah. and he mm-hmm. said he'd had similar experiences where he had to just leave. He just got this, I have to leave now. Um, so that's, I mean, I didn't really, I mean, I, back in those days, I didn't see anything in the woods or anything. And I certainly didn't have that experience in Cornwall, not the same experience. The only thing I can, I mean, I've had a few experiences there, but one of them, and Josh jogged my memory early because he, he mentioned the big black dogs. Well, mm-hmm. it wasn't really a big black dog that I saw, but I was with a friend in uh, um, on uh, was it Rose Wall, which is a very uh, it's, it's a it's a far end of Cornwall. It's a big granite hill. Um, is 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 Trent Crom and Rose Wall? They're both ancient um, sites where people used to live, and you know all the the Spriggans and uh, the Knockers are all supposedly around there. Mm-hmm. And I was up there on quite a sort of, well, it's quite a nice day to start with. And this mist came in with a, with a friend. I was trying to think how old I was. 16. I think I was 16. And I used to go up there a lot and just lay around on the rocks listening to music at the time and um, just, just take anybody up there, you know. And I was up there with my mate, Alan. And we saw this little black dog just emerge from the mist. It's very quiet. One of these quiet moments. But I think mist does that anyway because i've had i've had a similar experience on the water when i was surfing very similar um so this little black dog came out and it just sort of came up to us and just sort of looked at us no no noise or anything just looking at us and it 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 just seemed really strange because its eyes were a bit weird and sort of blackish but they it went off and it went off through another bank of mist over to our right and this is all i'm trying to explain that this was all granite, huge outcrops of granite all over the top of the hill. Mm-hmm. And my mate, who's a very, very materialist, he he probably thought nothing of it. It's just it's just somebody's stray dog, you know. Mm-hmm. And it possibly was. But we were expecting the owners of this dog to appear through the mist and sort of, oh, have you seen our dog? Mm-hmm. Seen my dog? No, no one. Absolutely no one. And you know, as the mist cleared, we could see all around. You can generally see down the slopes where there's um, old tin mine shafts and so on. You have to be careful where you're treading up there. It's just covered in like um, heather, depending mm-hmm. on the time of year, but there's always heather there. And you, you can get lost on these. You, I mean, uh, you can get lost up on these places. Um, I, got, I got lost on a place nearby called Nils Steeple. It's on the front of my book. I don't know. I think, uh, it's here somewhere. I don't know if you can see <laughs> where that that place there Ooh, up a bit there. It's a it's oh, yeah. a man-made mm-hmm. steeple on one of these mm-hmm. hills, and we went we went to, uh, who I t- yeah I took Janice up there I think it was, and we got up there easy enough. I've been up there many times, and it was sort of early evening, and when we got up there, by the time we tried to get back, oh thanks Chris, <laughs> by the time we got back. <laughs> or wanted to go back we couldn't find our way back down it's just ridiculous because it wasn't that far down to where i was parked Mm. and every path we took was the wrong one and Mm. and we were starting to get where janice was getting panicky i I wasn't i thought we'd get there eventually but um she was getting really quite scared um because by now it's starting to get dark and I was giving her stories about Spriggans and so on. I don't think that helped. <laughs> but um, it was so it was 
it was just so weird that I could not find my way back. And yet it's it's a clear landmark. It's there's a little lane that runs sort of a, I think it's about ten minute walk away from there. But it took us about half an hour or more to get back because we just kept taking the wrong and and they say you can get turned around by the by the, the ferries, you know, the piskies. Um yeah, yeah pisky led, yeah. And yeah, I had experience of that with my family down there as well. They lived in St. Ives or Snives, as they call it, Snives. <laughs> um, and they, 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 they used this in their everyday life. They talked about, like, like Josh said earlier, about how it's in the, it's in the language, it's in the culture. And they, I don't think they even knew that it was folklore. It was just expressions that they used all the time. Sure. And my, my cousin, my, my, his mother would often say to me, "Oh, oh, Keith was." Pisky led again last night, and to her, that was like he had too much to drink, and he sort of got lost on the way home, and you know, <laughs> silly things like that. But it, it was in their lexicon all the time; it was just there. But it's like they they did study this stuff. They it was just there, you know, yeah. part of mm. it. Exactly. I don't know if either one of you have ever seen the film Legend with uh, Tom Cruise. It came out in the eighties. It was a a kind of mystical film about basically about this legend uh <laughs> what a description <laughs> I, <laughs> I should do i should be a film critic exactly <laughs> um, but there's a a fairy in the film named una who it kind of appears as an orb and she's actually very jealous of the lead female character because she's in love with Tom Cruise's character. And it's a fascinating thing where they get locked in jail and she's the only one who's able to get out and free them. And she does so kind of begrudgingly. Do you, do you think that there's th that kind of a relationship where there's a envy of, of the human of humankind? I mean, absolutely. There's um, there are a lot of allusions to fairies taking mortals as lovers. Um, if you look at the changeling mythos, you could probably make an argument that there's a certain degree of jealousy at play there as well, and why they want to take people. Um, there's also one of the more curious things that I've found is that there's sometimes allusions to fairies having a certain amount of jealousy for the fact that human beings have the opportunity opportunity to be saved through christianity mm -hmm. sometimes there are stories of people walking by fairy forts and hearing that the the good folk are lamenting the fact that they can't be saved um so there are all sorts of different things that would sort of Im imply that sort of uh jealousy and that sort of um you know capricious is the word that i always use when i get fairies brought to mind you know that's something that that simon young does talk mention in passing in his uh his essay on on the disney films is that you know even though Tinkerbell is sort of the go-to fairy that you say, oh, well, fairies weren't like Tinkerbell, she does have some um, some attributes that uh, are very consistent. And one of those is the jealousy that she displays, you know, between the relationship between uh, Peter and Wendy. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a certain... Uh, Morgan Daimler said this one time. They uh, said that uh, uh, fairies are not protectors, they're possessors. Um, right. And that, you know, that, that you can take that a couple of ways, actually. But one of the ways that you can take it is that, you know, they they are all about ownership um, in mm. a lot of ways. That, you know, this you should be respectful to this plot of land that I owe or you, uh, you know, there are all these stories about um, people who do something completely innocent and accidental. Like they run into a tree and they're blinded. And the reason yeah. is because that was a fairy tree, you know, <laughs> you, you transgressed in that way, but also, you know, yeah. a, a rarely discussed yeah. aspect of, of fairy folklore is the fact that they could be possessors in the, in the manner that we normally attribute to demonic possession nowadays. You know, that's mm -hmm. a very Christianized way to look at this much older phenomenon. But at one point it was thought that, you know, fairies could have, could sort of move into someone's body. Uh, in the same way that uh, any other spirit could. So, um, but yeah, that all sort of ties into this idea of um, of ownership and, and property being very important. Um, you know, there was that, there was a quote um, 
from uh, Crofton Croker, who had some great, a great series of books on uh, Irish folklore. And at one point he says that uh, it was decreed at some point in the distant past that the um, elves di divided the souls of, of men among them, uh, I believe is the language that he uses. And that brings me back into, you know, these other bits of Fortean and UFO literature. You know, Charles Fort said, I think we're property. And Whitley mm -hmm. Strieber was famously told, you know, you have no, he, he said to his captors, you have no right to do what you're doing to me. And they you said, have we no have right. Every, That's yeah, right. we have every right is what they said in reply. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So there does seem to be like sort of a possessiveness that's completely in line with that romantic possessiveness as well. Mm. It's interesting in the beginning of that film when she's kind of when Mia Sarah's character is kind of like flitting around in the forest and it's this very beautiful, um, very idyllic looking environment and you see, you know, the wispy dress that she's wearing and it's almost like this atmosphere in the air and she it's it's a really beautiful film. The, just the the cinematography is absolutely brilliant and she goes to this woman's house who's her friend and she says the woman says as she's leaving she says like watch out for and she names these different types of fairies and she said in toadstools and what i found so fascinating about that is like here's this woman who lives out in the forest and her language is watch out for these fairies. Like these aren't your friends. These are the, these are the mesmerizers. These are the people who are going to lead you astray. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that there, if there ever is a fairy films too, I think there's plenty of films that could be covered and legend is, is certainly one of them. Um, I'll, I'll confess to having either. I haven't uh, either. I've seen bits and pieces of it or I haven't seen the whole thing, but, um, but I think that would be a good one to, to go back to. And, and there was sort of a, there was a a matter of factness and a presence of an urgency, I guess, of of threat um, that these things would possess. That you might run into them just the same. That you know, if you live in Florida, your your parents might say, "Look out for the gators," <laughs> um, you know, sort of thing. Like you know, you need to be you need to be aware of of these things that are around you. And there were all sorts of um, precautions that could be taken. Um, but yeah, and also you know what that what your what that line from the movie sort of alludes to as well is sort of the diverse taxonomy that you're looking at when you're looking at fairy folklore. Even within you know a relatively small region, you might have all sorts of different qualities and classes of characteristics of of spirits that would be um, mm. that had their own agendas in mind. Yeah. Well, and the lure is that she's an innocent. And she's mm. kind of kind of roaming around this forest very innocently. Mm -hmm. And ultimately she gets kind of taken into this dark energy. Uh, you know, there's a unicorn mm -hmm. mythology in the film and, and she's not supposed to see or touch the unicorn. And then she breaks that covenant and touches it. And then that brings her into this dark Lord's world. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's 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 the mother-in-law rules. <laughs> like I said, it's it's you know, there's something you're not supposed to do, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. And if you do it, then it's bad news. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Chris just found uh, the Una clip. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Is that would that be a good one to play? Yeah, it's yeah. great. Okay, now I have to refigure out how to share here. One second. Let's see. Yeah, I well, I think what I love about it is that there's this, there's two films that are happening at once. There's the beginning of the movie where it's this dreamy, dream sequency type of film. And then when this innocent woman breaches this, this line, you know, she basically breaks the rules of the forest and she touches this unicorn then the entire thing turns into like a blizzard and everything freezes and it, it goes into a whole different realm, but the fairies still exist. Mm -hmm. The fairies they, they, are still capable of interacting. Oh, and, and you know, that, that, that aspect of the storm, I mean, is incredibly important to fairy lore. I mentioned earlier that there was an association between winds and storms, but you know, oftentimes. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. 
Yeah. Oftentimes in these in these myths and legends, um, storms would be sort of used as a as a demarcation point, perhaps even a, a, a means of of transportation to the other world. Sometimes it yes. would be by a storm. I think the legend of Percival yeah. um, features sort of a blizzard, uh, just along the lines of what you're talking about too. So now I'll shut my mouth. Let's see. <laughs> let's see if it will play the clip or what this is. Oh, I forgot oh, to it's turn mu- the It's on. muted. Yeah. Sinking too soon and I saw oh, when you moved. Hands on the bar. That- this is just like a music video. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Oh, gosh. It's, it's like, like YouTube roulette. You never know what you're going to get. Exactly. <laughs> Una and Jack kiss from legend. <laughs> you might be better to go through these. Yeah, I'm not sure. Let me go back up. Um... Oh, yes, yes, this is the clip, actually. Oh, cool. Now, how do I? Yeah, you're good. Oh, don't worry. Our mother can take care of herself, I'm sure. I think. Scruple's right. It's more important that you find the unicorn. Want to have Una fly out and find a key? Una, when she's much too small, could never lift it. What happens? So what's, off right what's interesting about that <laughs> is that she has lied to the other fairies and they don't know. They think she's just this little orb of light. They don't know that she can be embodied and she's revealed herself to him. So Tom Cruise's character knows that she can be like, not human size, but fairy size to be mm-hmm. able to get these keys. But what I like is that she does this thing where she turns herself into the girl that he really loves to get that energy from him, but he doesn't buy it. And that's one of the more chilling things that I've, I've found sort of going through some fairy folklore is, is that they weren't above appearing as people, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know um, especially in the case of, you know, child abduction, sometimes they're, they're not a ton of allusions to this, but you can find some allusions to them appearing as parents um, to sort of draw children away. So that, that extends to that as well. Um, yeah. And the other thing that struck me about that scene as I was watching it is like, you know, they're, they're calling Una a fairy as if any of the other characters besides Tom Cruise in that scene aren't also sort of falling <laughs> under that fairy umbrella. Exactly. You know, Mark yeah. was talking earlier about the mermaids and there's, there's some discussion back and forth about whether or not mermaids should be considered fairies. But like in the way that I look at it, 
in the sort of way that you look at the folklore around these things, those primary aspects that I mentioned earlier that Diane Perkis sort of outlined um, apply to so many of these things, including things that you wouldn't associate with being fairies, like giants and, you know, mermaids and right. even some dragon folklore and wild man folklore. I mean, they, they so if, what happens is that fairy yeah. sort of becomes this umbrella term that you get. Um, and to that extent, um, it kind of makes looking at fairy folklore a little bit more complicated because the term was also used a lot of times similar to the way that we would use the terms paranormal or supernatural. Right. You know, that's, a, that's a fairy thing. So, um, but yeah, I need to, I really need to watch slash rewatch uh, yes. that again. Um, yes. You know, cause, but because it, I think, I think, but I think that like I, I had to have fairy films happen before I would, I would appreciate it because I'm sure that there was a time relatively recently where i'd be like oh she's got wings so that's not you know that's not often <laughs> but, but again it's that other aspect that i sort of learned about while putting this together which was the perseverance of of some of this genuine folklore even in the face of stuff that isn't plucked directly from you know uh 14th century france or something yeah which leads into what you wrote your essay about uh, a movie that i'd never seen before called borgman Mm -hmm. maybe what maybe explain what drew you to that which may many people might not see as an obvious connection to fairy right so i remember when this movie came out and i thought it looked creepy and i was excited to see it and uh, i distinctly remember i think i might have even watched it with my parents and we were like huh that kind of sucked <laughs> um, but, um and it wasn't until later that a uh Someone uh, wrote me, I wish I could remember who it was, and I've long since deleted the email, but someone wrote me and said, you know, have you seen Borgman that has a lot of fairy motifs in it? And I said, yeah, I don't know about that. And they said, take another look. So when this came back around, I, I watched it, and what I was struck by, and of course I'm, I'm inclined to believe this because, you know, it's a project that I did, and it's the entire argument that I make, but I think that there is no way to make any of that film have any sort of logical sense unless you interpret it as a as not a fairy tale but a fairy story like a story that's drawing upon all these folkloric elements um that that you see if you look at these different traditions um because otherwise it just kind of seems like a hodgepodge of of randomness like who mm -hmm. are the people that well maybe i should outline the, the plot of borgman but yeah, yeah even in terms of plot it's not got a lot of incident um there is a mysterious man um, with a group of other mysterious people who are <laughs> flushed out of a hiding place by a priest <laughs> in the opening. And um, it's the story of how this vagabond inserts himself into this upper class family um, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in this, you know, European community. Uh, it was it was the 2013. Um, was it Sweden? Wasn't it? It was a Dutch film. So, um, but it was a uh, it was uh, oh, nominated for the Sweden, best. Yeah. It was nominated for best foreign language film. Mm. Um, but uh, you know, he um, he uh, he sort of ins insinuates himself in this family, and he's taken under the wing of the the uh, mother. It's a family of of three. Um, and uh, he sort of assumes the role of gardener, and then he starts bringing in some of the other people that you saw him with in the beginning. And, uh, you know, on, at first glance, not a lot of supernatural things happen, but there are a lot of different expressions of different things that I think only make sense once you invoke the supernatural. And, you know, there are these allusions to him taking... Oh, actually, I think maybe it's not a family of three. It might be a family of four. But he takes the children back to his underground lair and they put a syringe in their back. It's just all this weird stuff where you're like, what the heck even is this? But once you sort of apply that filter of, of fairy folklore over the top of it, you start seeing things like changelings and sort of, you know, um, there's even something he, uh, yeah. he, he acquires his role as gardener with his family by afflicting, um, by afflicting the garden, their previous gardener with like a blow dart, which looks exactly like what you'd think the the fairy stroke or elf shot might look like, mm -hmm. um, and it just keeps on going on down the line. Like at one point, he addresses a dog by the name of one of the people that he was hanging out with or elsewhere in the film, and you're like, "What is that? What's going on there?" But again, if you have this idea of black dogs and dogs being a shape shifted mm -hmm. form of the fairies, it starts to make some degree of sense. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, you know, the, uh, the director, um, Alex Van Varmerdam, uh, is kind of closed-lipped about the meaning behind Borgman, but I just can't help but imagine that he had to have... I, I think this film either indicates one of two things. Either he is very well-versed in this folklore and knew exactly what he was doing, and, and my interpretation is correct, or... Um, these archetypes and these myth themes are so um, are so prevalent that they just sort of manifested of their own accord in his in his work because it Double it's death. so it's yeah. yeah it's it's so it's it yeah. ends up so specific um, and as a result I, I enjoy the film a lot more now <laughs> you know I I remember it being very divisive amongst critics um, you know even though it did have that coveted uh, foreign film. Uh, nom nomination for the Academy Awards, um, there were a lot of critics who just said exactly what I said to begin with. Like, what is this? Is it an allegory for the environment? Is it an allegory for capitalism? What, you know, it doesn't make any sense. There's no internal logic. And I think that, again, it, it does make some sense once you once you apply that filter. And now here, 10 years later, I, I, I appreciate it more than I ever did at the time. I am so glad we got to talk about Legend. I just love that movie, and I was just really glad that that it came up. I was hoping it would come up. You you made sure that happened, right? You you brought it up, didn't you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have yourself to thank. Uh, yeah, I can't speak for all that because I don't think that I've ever seen that movie. None of that looked familiar to me. I think I probably at that point in time when that came out, I would have not seen it just because Tom Cruise was in it. Yeah, it was kind of it was a Ridley Scott movie. That's why I jumped on it. Mm -hmm. What else did he do? Ridley Scott did yeah. uh Blade Runner. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew I always get him and the other big filmmaker, the alien guy, or did he do alien too? Tony Scott, his brother? Uh I think uh Shecky Scott. Um Shemp Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Dred Scott, um, Dred Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, anyway, uh, other than that, yes, uh, I you might corner me into seeing that movie someday. It looked interesting. You. It's so good. It's so good. But if you're even if you're not a preteen girl in the eighties, yeah, yeah, and it's you know Tom Cruise is very not. It's not about Tom Cruise at all. Yeah. I've just got used to seeing Tom Cruise movies. I mean, the only way I could acclimate him is if he's pl playing a prick. Yeah. Yeah. Because it seems to come very naturally. To him. Yeah. You don't like him in the danger zone. I don't. On the highway to the danger zone. No, I don't think that I've ever seen the <laughs> danger zone. Is that, are you just pulling my leg? It's uh what's the name of that movie? People come on there. This is being recorded, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure there are people screaming it right now giggling yeah saying it's it to the, their car it's radios the, their... it's the it's the the airplane movie oh top gun top gun there we go yeah <laughs> danger zone that's the kenny Loggins song that was in top gun right? okay so the chat was good chat was great it was. there's a lot of lag on mark's end which sucks because it's kind of hard to you know he always has to jump in when For we're already sake. when why we need to go to see mark and get him hardwired yeah, exactly. <laughs> get off this goddamn wi-fi cave that he's in that he's yeah, always yeah, been in he's going in the red but he's always been in in yeah. there he's every, always had every technical, he, yes technical difficulties yes. for sure he needs to join the 21st century <laughs> <laughs> he needs fiber. He is in Illinois. <laughs> he so. needs fiber in his diet. <laughs> anyway, it was it's been a while since we've chatted. Yeah, with we Mark, love so Mark. it was good. He's awesome. Good to have Mark on. It hasn't been too long since we chatted with Josh, but it's always good to have an excuse to chat with Josh. He's not only a fantastic author, but a uh, very well spoken and very knowledgeable individual. Yeah, they're so they're both so smart yes. and just so fun. I you know, I am obsessed with the British Isles and you know, I've that's been always my dream to go to Ireland and England and oh, yeah. Scotland and 
and to visit those parts of the world. And so when we get going with Mark talking about Surrey and Cornwall, I get so excited because I can just close my eyes and visualize what that part of the world is like and realms and mist. And Speaking of which, it. it's kind of looking like we're in one of those places today. I know. I love yeah, it. It's very misty outside. Yeah. It's this, you know, those gosh darn chemtrails. <laughs> <laughs> mists existed before chemtrails yeah but yeah. this is this is definitely man-made this is not the same natural i still like how it looks yeah i do yeah. too who who knows what's in the air that we're breathing but it's pretty <laughs> <laughs> so yes um we did not stay on the topic of fairies and films but i suspected that we wouldn't anyway and it went all kinds of wonderful places and uh yeah, I enjoyed it. I love talk of fairies. Fairies were one of the first things that sort of got me into the paranormal. Um, hearing about them when I was growing up, obviously, in fairy tales and stuff like that, where they were in a realm where, you know, there was no reason to think of them as even remotely real. And then growing up and then reading probably uh, fairy faith in Celtic countries kind of cemented that, like, this is a thing. This is not just, I mean, it is legend and lore, but it's, there are stories passed down from experiences. Yeah. I, I am of the ilk that they are all related. So, you know, gins and fairies and giants and dwarves and gnomes and brownies and elves and all of them that it's like, humans there are many different varieties and shapes and sizes of humans and i would put uh fairies and all of those other categories under the same umbrella and i who i kept thinking of was cory daniel because i think cory daniel has done a bunch of work on giants hmm. so i would love to have him back on the show to talk about that that was one thing at the end of our interview with him that he mentioned uh, is that he has done a, a tremendous amount of research in the giant realm. And mm. I would love to, because I'm obsessed with that whole realm. She's always asking me to talk giant to her. So I don't know. It's uh, also because out of the corner of my eye, I see this book that says Lost Race of the Giants. <laughs> so that may have been yeah. subconsciously. I got in that there. with you in mind. <laughs> I did. It's the Jason uh, Brashear's book, right? Back uh, when he was going to come on our podcast, Choinard. Which one are you talking about? Oh, this one. Yeah, that's Choinard. The, that's, the, that's the. Um. Oh, that's not the one I was thinking. Of. Never mind. Yeah. Never mind. Yeah, Bashir's is up there. Giants of the ancient earth. There you that's go. That's the Jason Bashir's. Okay. We are very giant friendly around here, and fairy friendly. All of it friendly. We're yeah. curiosity friendly. Yeah. And, you know, when we go out into the woods with the kids, this has happened a, a few times where our younger son in particular has said, I want to see a Bigfoot or I want to have some experience with some some otherworldly thing. And I think he rides this line of maybe wanting to have that experience, but also maybe being slightly fearful or trepidatious about that because we are so in this world and of this earth that I think he probably has a healthy respect for the known and the things that he can observe. Um, but he also has an incredible curiosity about wanting to have some mystical experience like that. Me too. I totally understand it. I'm right there in the same boat. Yeah. Yeah. I won't go into all that again, but. But I think they're there. Of I think, course. I, I think yeah, that's what obviously. we're, I think that's one of the things that we were kind of dancing on is this idea that. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be this perfect environment to have these experiences that these things are around all the time. It's whether or not we are dialed in to observing them. Yeah. I think there's a variety of different ways to interact with that. Yeah. What do you realm dimension, whatever you want to call it. I mean, I think that in some places it's so strong 
like they call them thin places where mm -hmm. the veil is so thin that even people who may not be looking for them or even believe in stuff like that see stuff like that yeah. and there i think most of the earth or at least places in the earth like you know western where western civilization is the dominating uh uh reality um if it's not on the menu then people don't even know that that's a frequency or that there's frequencies period so they it takes a, a maybe a more uh developed or sophisticated sensitivity to see things like that or to recognize things when you see them or when you experience them well in our library i i would say other than the occult section the largest section of books that we have are about folklore worldwide fairy lore um celtic fairies irish fairies like you know fairies hither and tither from far and yon because uh, i i just have an obsession with with uh communicating with that world i really i'm into it yeah, there was a book that I got at a at a New Age bookstore, which is what they were called then. Are they do New Age bookstores still exist? Um, yeah, yeah. But I always frequented frequented those mm -hmm. because they had the most well developed yeah. occult and metaphysical sections. Basically, the whole store was that. Mm -hmm. And there was a book that I got there, and I wish I mean remembering the title would be a good first step. Something to do with devic devic existence d-e-v-i-c existence and it described the hierarchy of divas which is basically mm -hmm. what we're talking about fairies nature spirits mm -hmm. elementals and described them as if it were a science book um really thin book but i i have not come across it since then i don't know if i imagined it i know that i didn't actually but i would love to run across that book again um uh, yeah, it's been a while since I've tried to search for it, but it was really super fascinating. Okay, so here's my question. <laughs> you always say that like there's like there's one question. Okay, all the, the what's before and after aside, this is my question. Okay, so if you could if you could have one of these ex three experiences, which would you choose? Okay, seeing a fairy, mm -hmm. seeing a alien, or seeing a Bigfoot. I would have to say, well, it's right off the bat, it's between Bigfoot and a fairy. Um, you know, and then I overthink it and go, well, it depends on this, <laughs> depends on the context, because I would love to see a Bigfoot, but I wouldn't want to be five foot away from it. Um, we'll say a fairy or a fairy or a little person. I'm fairy all day long. All day long. Fairy. All day long. <laughs> all night long. Yeah, I can't do fairy. that. Like you can't. Fairy all day long, yeah. be just because of my my desire to connect, and I'm sure it has a lot to do with legend and and yeah, that time course. period and Cocteau twins and these mystical, uh, you know, this magical world that I created with my best friend. Like I am just obsessed with that that version of reality, mm -hmm. and so. To me, I don't see them as being malevolent spirits or malevolent energies or um, energies that can somehow be possessive. I I see them as friends. <laughs> well, I think it's all of the above. I think, as he said, as Josh said, that there are some that are friendly and some that yeah. are will fuck with you because they enjoy it again. Yeah. A shark isn't evil because he may come across you and take a bite out of your leg. Mm -hmm. He's just being a shark. Mm -hmm. uh, so these things just exist, just have a completely different list of priorities than we do. And when they, you know, when we bump butt heads uh, in the wrong way or in an awkward way, or you surprise one or something mm -hmm. like that, you may get a reaction that seems like it's there's ill intent behind it but that's just doing its thing you know it's i think a lot of them just like to fuck with humans in the sense of like playing with them because i'm, I'm sure many of us seem so small-minded and so 
uh, it's easy to catch us off guard. And well, I think it's th the reason I'm most attracted to that world is that for me, the, the rules of uh, nature apply there in a different um, to a different degree than they do in the world of uh, modernity. And mm. there it seems like there's more of a a natural balance and I'm just attracted to that that uh, just that just that connection with the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's that's immediately why I went to Bigfoot or fairies is because they are nestled in the natural world. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to see them on a well, maybe you are in a different form on a military base. <laughs> you're going to see them out in the forest, and I like hanging out in forests more than military bases. So yeah. you're going to see it in its natural habitat as opposed to some place that it was created or being experimented on, or you know. Yeah. I think there's just more, there's more of a sense of uh, connection or maybe a respect for the ecosystem in that, in those realms to me, in my mind, it just seems like there, there's more magic there and mm -hmm. there's things that exist that are more um, like, like that it, like it's more attainable because it's coming it's more earthbound, mm -hmm. but it's earthbound with like a healthy respect for um, esotericism and that whole, it's like these things work together. They're not working against each other. And just as much or more than I would like to see a fairy, I would like to hear fairy music. Because I've heard that's very heavenly and sublime. I mean, I feel like we have. Cocktail twins? For sure. For sure. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> but like coming out of the forest at night, out of a fairy circle. Yeah, I've done that. I mean, that's that was what the 80s was for me, man. <laughs> in Kansas City, there were fairy circles. There were in my in my realm. There were for sure. We were we were out in the woods making fairy circles <laughs> where the sun don't shine. <laughs> all right. Okay. Enough of all this <laughs> banter. Wonderful conversation. Mm -hmm. I hope that you all enjoyed it or got something positive out of it. Um, I highly suggest fairy films. I have not, admittedly, completed the whole thing. But what I have read has been very uh, compelling, if that topic interests you. Um, but also Mark Wyatt's other work, uh, Spirit of Cornwall, I have both volumes of that. That's good stuff. And just about anything I've read from Josh is amazing. So let's bring earth magic back. That's what I think the punctuation of these discussions in particular are about is let's get more in tune with nature and our essence and the magical realms that exist right here. Right now. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm all about it. Okay. Um, thank you to those who support us. Thank you. The, the mixer isn't turned up, so. On um, purpose, you doubt it down. No, I just didn't. Uh, just, I didn't think that we'd play anything. So, what if it. I hit that? What's that going to do? What if I hit this? <laughs> that. Um, I don't remember what I was going to say. Oh, <laughs> thank you for those uh, supporters who support us. There will be more of this interview uh, behind the paywall if you should choose to support us as a a gesture of appreciation for doing so. Um, if you would like to get a hold of us to if you support us. <laughs> yes. Um you're making me lose my train of thought here. Oh come on. Get it back. <laughs> That's more like I remember where I was back in 1922. <laughs> Um, yes. If you want to contact us for whatever reason, guest 
recommendations, whatever recipes, uh, the melt podcast at protonmail.com or for the owls out there who <laughs> want to contact us. Or you can email me at hunter hyphen muse at protonmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. Why did I put such a rowdy crowd noise on there? It's like somebody's just hopped on a table and started taking off their tube top. All right. Much love. Stay tuned. <laughs>